Auzubillahiminashshaitanirrajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, I'm very grateful and honored that uh, such respectable people are sitting amongst the audience. The Honorable President of Pakistan, the Honorable Foreign Minister, the Honorable uh, Kashmir Committee Chairman, to a lot of diplomats, ambassadors, civil society. And um, I recall last year what happened in the world. We witnessed uh, a way similar, not a similar, but a, a fraction of the lockdown or um, curfew or siege that the Kashmiri people witness all throughout their lifetime, especially after 5th of August 2019 Act, when India committed the latest form of war, which is called lawfare. And through a presidential order, they passed a death warrant, a genocide act against an entire unarmed and defenseless nation. But uh, sadly, the whole world was under lockdown last year, and we saw a lot of people losing their loved ones, colossal losses of economies, unemployment, uncertainty, uh, people locked up in their homes and uh, uh, not having enough vaccines or medications or ventilators in the hospitals. So it was, some, in, in, in a way, this time, I think uh, the audience uh, because I see a lot of diplomats can relate to it and to a lot of Pakistanis what it feels like to be in your homes, losing your loved ones, not being in contact, aeroplanes are closed, the airports are closed. Uh, but for Kashmiris, this is something which we breathe day in and day out. Uh, students cannot go to school for months. There are army camps inside colleges, schools, on the streets, every nook and corner. And uh, when we go through history, I mean, we have seen various wars and conflict zones and all types of tortures happening around in the past. But uh, what we see in Kashmir, uh, these are not acts of individual violence, such as sexual violence, but we have state patronage coming from the Indian state authorities, whatever they do with the Kashmiri people. Uh, we have no right to live, to breathe, to uh, exercise our political freedom. And uh, my husband, along with various other political prisoners because he is leading the peaceful resistance movement along with others. He's also locked up in the hard death cell. Uh, we as a family are divided. Once again, this is the sixth year of uh, being away from each other. From two years, we cannot hear his voice. That is the story of every divided family or of political prisoners. And right now, what's happening over there, India has, after committing this lawfare, has surpassed all international norms and treaties, Geneva Conventions, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, all bilateral treaties. Uh, they have even su superseded their own Indian constitution because this was the only organ, 370 and 35A, that used to connect them with uh, administratively so-called controlling Kashmir. But now the difference is that before we had their occupation over there, the occupational forces, which are the highest in the world, but now the Indian public can go and shift there and transform it into a mini India. I mean, you people should realize that this area is a disputed territory where not Indian law falls, but international law falls over there. That should be exercised there. They have violated Geneva Convention 4. They are changing our demography. They are marginalizing the Kashmiris. And in simple terms, Kashmiris have become refugees on their own land. We have become stateless. All our rights of ownership have been snatched and given away to Indians. And to those Indians that follow the Modi, the fascist, the Hindutva, the Akhand Bharat narrative. And right now, the RSS diehard follower because RSS is a terrorist organization that has been involved in numerous terrorist activities over decades, be it Mecca bombings, targeting the uh, churches of Christians, forced conversions of Christians, uh, the Gujarat killings, and many others. And what's happening in Kashmir is nothing new for the world. But now, at least, because this is a law of nature, that a time comes when uh, completely helpless, voiceless people, they have given their utmost to combat, and they are coffin-clad, combating the highest fully equipped army. But this is the maximum the Kashmiri people can do. And now it's the turn of all those people around the world to play an effective role, to raise a voice before this world 
becomes totally, totally unsafe. And we must not forget uh, 27th of February in 2019 when nuclear codes were exchanged between India and Pakistan. The world was very close to witnessing a micro-nuclear exchange, which means that if, God forbid, that would have happened, then definitely two-thirds of the world's population would have been wiped out. This is not me saying it. This is nuclear scientists' research that says that there can be nuclear ice age, we can freeze to death, and there can be nuclear famine. Humanity can end. And this is so close to all of you. You all will be affected by it, not just people of that conflict of Kashmir. And now we have three nuclear countries. We don't have just India and Pakistan. We also have China and Ladakh. So it's at loggerheads. The situation is escalating. And the only hope right now for the world is to save the Kashmiris, to save the Kashmiri representatives, because that chair is lying missing. Luckily, I'm over here because I cannot go there, because even against me, uh, Indians think I am also a terrorist, because I'm supporting the voice of my people, and my husband is in a death cell, five by seven death cell, and he's being physically and mentally tortured because he is the face of that resistance. And I am speaking up about him and about the plight of Kashmiri women, children, political prisoners, and what they're going through. And then India labels me as a terrorist because I am a woman. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a vocal woman. I will rise up even when I cannot sleep for almost two years. I have not spoken to my husband's wedding anniversary. Till from these two years have been a living hell for all Kashmiris. And the day they raided him, they tore away our wedding albums, they burnt our home, and that's what they did with a lot of other Kashmiris, and then the nuclear codes were exchanged. And right now, where are we heading as humanity? That is the big question mark. So I appeal to all of you, especially to the countries that are directly linked with the United Nations and to the United Nations Secretary General and UN President, I met them and I told them that it's high time that you must nominate a Kashmir envoy. Kashmiri people are dying, we are defenseless, and we need your support before the Kashmiris become extinct. And you can only see us in museums, our shawls, our handicraft, our culture, our heritage, and by that time it will be too late. So I think we must bring those Kashmiri leadership and people back from their prisons, get them released. And right now, what's happening in India, the minorities, the way they are suffering over there, the farmers' movement, the anti-minority bills, construction of a mandir on Babri Masjid, all these things are linked with the fascist Hindutva mindset of Modi. And the Kashmiri leadership used to appeal to the Indian public that please stop voting for such leaders, because a time will come what you people are doing with innocent Kashmiris who are fighting peacefully for their legitimate right of freedom. If you will not raise a voice for us, then God forbid, a time will come when such voices, such leadership, such mindset will burn you apart and your secular fabric will be torn apart. And that is what is happening. And I think this is the time that the Indian people should also rise up against this, the public of India against such policies, because this is not good, not just for India, but for the entire region. So thank you. And in the end, just a few verses I would like to share with all of you, which I have written for my husband, uh, Yasin Malik, who is right now in the hard death cell, and fabricated forged cases are being filed against him. And they can do anything with him, hang him, lifetime imprisonment, whatnot, and no legal excess. And this is the story of Asya and Rabi. This is the story of Saeed Ali Gilani, of Mirwais Umar Farooq, because they want our entire movement to become leaderless. And if we ever, the world desires a solution to this problem, then Kashmiri representatives are part of that solution. Otherwise, I'm afraid that we are heading towards World War III because the nuclear commands of India are in the hands of a fascist, a radical, and a thirsty, bloodthirsty man of Kashmiris. So these are the verses. Oh my Yasin, where have you gone? It's been 23 months and 17 days since we heard your merry voice. How it haunts me what you whispered the night of 22nd of Feb when we exchanged our wedding woes a decade ago. 
Now the tyrant whips you with a single blow and drags you by the handcuff to such a low. To little Razia Sultana, your final words. My daughter, I'm going afar. Yet she peeps restlessly, thy window searching thy stars. Where is Papa hiding behind the moon? I'm afraid it's the gallows of barrack number seven, Tehar, where no light descends, nor sunlight creeps into the walls. Calamitous was thy night of severance, terrible beyond words. I'd die with pain had I to die that night. O oh my Kashmir, when the vultures took you away, all your admirers left you astray. You gave a glimpse of heaven, they say, another name for paradise. Our hearts are bleeding, blood dripping from our veins. Some brothers of Hitler are celebrating blood parties on our soil so red. Thy rivers are red with graves at every mile. Oh my Kashmir, oh my Kashmir, thank you.